right, so this week in chapter six, we are talking all about procedures, and we have been talking about procedures a little bit throughout this course so far. In fact, what we've talked about so far are event procedures, which is what this video is all about. So you'll get a little bit of a review, but we'll actually start introducing a little bit more information as we go along, start expanding our knowledge to talk about every single possible type of procedure that's out there. So that's what this whole chapter is about. So let's get into it. In this video, we are covering F6.1, which is event handling sub procedures, which is a whole mouthful, but we'll get into what exactly that means. All right, so I want to talk first more generally about what procedures are. Um, and you might have sort of gotten a sense about some of these things from working with the procedures that we've worked with so far in this class, but procedures are really a type of structure within the code. Um, they're a collection of statements that are assigned some kind of name, and those statements are only run when that name is somehow invoked, uh, sort of like the calculate procedures that you would make when people would click the calculate button on an application, all of that code is actually only run when this calculate procedure is invoked by name. Um, you can also think of it sort of like how a uh, program will actually keep the names of variables and constants sort of set aside so that when someone refers to a variable by name, you know, Visual Basic can actually go and reference that variable and then look for the memory address in which all of the data that that variable actually contains, you know, look in there and see all of that data, right? So we use the variable's name to get that data out of the variable. Well, in a similar manner, um, Visual Basic will use the name of a procedure to actually uh, know when to run all of the statements contained within that procedure. So names are really important for procedures in the same way as they are important for variables here. Uh, procedures are always uh, entered or typed or something like that between the public class and end class lines within a program. So when you're in the definition of form main, um, you go between public class and end class of that, and all of the procedures in there are, you know, that that's the proper place to put the procedures. And that's the place where they go when you actually create a procedure using those drop-down menus in Visual Studio. Uh, procedures must also be created outside of any other procedure. You, you don't nest procedures within procedures like you might nest an if statement within an if statement or something like that. That doesn't happen with procedures. They're only created inside of a class, but outside of any other procedure, at least in Visual Basic. It gets a little bit funny when you get into other programming languages that have things like anonymous functions, which, you know, I talked about how important it is for functions to have names. Well, anonymous functions don't necessarily have a name with them, but you know, that is a whole can of worms. It's a very cool can of worms. It's a can of worms that I highly recommend you try tasting, but um, we're not worrying about that with Visual Studio. In Visual Studio, they are always created outside of any other procedure. They always have a name, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, the procedures we have been working with in uh, Visual Basic so far are specifically event handling sub procedures, which is a mouthful. Let me try to break that down for you. Um, they are procedures. You know, they're a block of statements. They have a name. Uh, that name is invoked in order to tell Visual Basic to run all of the statements in the block that they contain. They're a sub procedure. Um, you know, when you see that private sub and then say button calc underscore click or something like that. That sub, uh, I believe it's short for subroutine, but that sub uh, indicates that it's 
well, a sub procedure. Um, that's the best way I can think of to talk about it right now because we haven't really introduced the other type of procedure yet. And when we introduce that other type of procedure, it'll be easier to compare and contrast sub versus that other type. But sub is what you're familiar with right now. Uh, it just runs a whole bunch of statements. And then when the last statement is run and you hit end sub, uh, the procedure exits and nothing special happens when it actually exits. So that's what's going on with the sub part of that. Uh, it, we enter the procedure when the name is actually invoked, we run all of the statements and then we exit the procedure. Uh, it's event handling because it handles an event. Uh, not all sub procedures actually have to handle events. In fact, we'll talk about sub procedures that don't handle events in the next video, but when they do handle events, um, it's super helpful because uh, those procedures are automatically evoked when um, Visual Studio actually uh, catches that event and says, hey, this procedure handles this event. So I, I see this event, we're going to see what this procedure wants to do. So in the case of button calc underscore click, that handles the button calc dot click event. When Visual Studio sees that someone has clicked button calc by way of noticing that the button calc uh, dot click event exists and is passing in front of its eyesight, it grabs that event and then it passes it over to button calc underscore click the procedure and says, hey, here's the event. Do what you want to do with that event. And then button calc underscore click actually runs. So that's the kind of thing that we're familiar with right now. These event procedures. Every single procedure we've worked with so far is an event handling sub procedure uh, that handles one event. Button calc underscore click handles the event button calc dot click. So that's what we're familiar with. We have some pretty solid footing for what one of these event handling sub procedures actually is so far. We have right here the procedure header. Um, the first line that says to Visual Basic that you are creating a, in this case, a sub procedure that handles an event. So it's an event procedure. Um, you always start with private sub. Private means it's not accessible from any other class, which, you know, we haven't really talked so much about how to access uh, things from other classes or even much about other classes in general, but you always want to keep private right here so that no one else can really mess with it. But then you have the name of the event procedure, uh, button calc underscore click in this case, and then you have your parameters, um, which we don't really worry about for uh, procedure headers just yet. We will soon, but we haven't worried so much about what parameters are so far. And then we have the handles clause, which tells Visual Basic which events this is actually handling. In other words, what events Visual Basic should catch and then pass to button calc underscore click in this case in order to make button calc underscore click run. And given that this is button calc underscore click, it probably only cares about button calc, excuse me, button calc dot click. So that's what we would put by this handles thing right here. Except we don't really need to put anything because Visual Studio kind of um, does that for us. So it's, it's very kind. But that's what the procedure header looks like. The, the first line of code that tells us, you know, we are starting this event procedure. Now parameters. I believe the last time we talked about parameters in any amount of detail was when we were talking about that key press event in the past where you could actually um, catch when the user presses a key inside of a text box and then only allow certain pieces of input by saying uh, throw out the key if it is not valid, if it is outside of the range of valid characters. Uh, and that actually used the um, E parameter, which we actually have right here, this E as event args. E has all of the information from the event. 
uh, in button calc underscore clicks case, it would be information from the click event of button calc. Uh, previously, when we were handling these uh, key pressed events, it was uh, information from that key press event for that text box where um, the information included what key was pressed and we used that to actually filter out invalid input. Uh, one of the other um, useful parts of that parameter was the handled uh, property, which we were able to set to true in order to trick Visual Basic into thinking that we successfully passed the key onto the text box so it didn't have to worry about it um, at all. So we essentially threw out that key completely. But all that information was in the E parameter. So a parameter you can think of as information passed to a procedure when a procedure is actually invoked. And you can treat it like a procedure scope variable, as if we defined everything in these parameters right here, sender and E in this case, um, as if we defined those in the first line of the procedure, like we normally would with our variables. However, unlike when we actually define our variables and either give them a value or let them be their default value until we assign them a value later on, uh, when we have parameters like this, we don't actually assign the value. Not immediately, at least. We might do that later. But we don't assign the value. Instead, the value is given to those parameters when the program actually invokes our procedure. So we don't know what values are in there until the code is actually running. You know, we don't know what key the user is going to press when the um, key pressed uh, event actually gets triggered and our, uh, you know, our procedure that filters out invalid keys gets invoked. We don't know what key is actually going to be in there. That's up to what the user is actually doing. So all that information gets filled in when the procedure is invoked, which means that we have to actually, um, you know, account for any possibility. We can't necessarily assume anything too much. Uh, we can assume, you know, the key that actually was pressed is a string containing some key, but we can't assume that it was the letter A or something like that, if that makes sense. But yeah, essentially, we don't know what those uh, parameters are going to hold. Um, that value actually is given to them when the procedure starts running. Whatever invoked that procedure gives those parameters that value, and then we treat the parameters as if they were procedure scope variables. Um, and I want to specify that in this case for button calc underscore click, the parameters are sender and e. This as object uh, is the type of sender, and as event args is the type of e, but those aren't actually parameters themselves. It's just sender and e. Those are the only two parameters for button calc underscore click. Now I also want to talk about procedure names, and this isn't just for event procedures right now, by the way. This information is actually going to carry on to all of the other videos about procedures that I'm going to make. Uh, we do have some rules for event procedures. Some of these rules do apply there, but these rules also apply to procedures that are not just event procedures. So these uh, naming requirements, and I, I guess they're less requirements and more very, very hard suggestions, but these uh, guidelines for naming procedures are going to be really helpful because they're going to help you make descriptive and useful procedure names that will really be helpful in letting uh, whoever is looking at your procedures, including yourself, know exactly what's going on in that procedure. And that goes doubly so if you pair 
your very descriptive procedure name with a very descriptive comment that really just says exactly what's going on in that procedure. If you have both of those, uh, you are never going to forget what a procedure does and you are not going to have to waste a ton of time looking through your procedure and actually double checking and seeing what's going on. So, let's get into it. Now, if your procedure is an event handling sub procedure that handles a single control and event pair, then you're going to name your procedure after the control and the event that's handled. For example, button calc underscore click handles button calc dot click. It only handles the one event, which is button calc dot click. So we take the name of the control, which is button calc. We put that at the beginning of our procedure name. And then we put an underscore instead of the dot because we're not allowed to use dots in our procedure names. And then you put the name of the event. So in this case, it's click. So we put click after the underscore. And that's the name of our event procedure that handles exactly one controls event. And that's what, we, what we've seen so far, which is super helpful. In fact, Visual Studio does that for us. It's really helpful. However, this doesn't work very well in any other case. For example, if a procedure handles events for multiple controls, or if it handles multiple events for one control, which is possible, and we'll get to that later on in this video. But in any of those cases, things start getting a little bit wacky. Um, which means that we'll have to actually choose a custom name for that procedure. And we can really use any name for that procedure. You don't have to stick to just this format. It's really helpful for event procedures that handle exactly one controls event. And you should do that for those types of procedures because it's really descriptive, descriptive of what's going on. Button calc underscore click is the procedure that handles what happens when the user clicks the calculate button, right? So you should continue to do that for those types of procedures. Any other type of procedure, it's going to be really helpful for you to use a custom name that describes what the procedure is doing. Um, let's look at some guidelines for how to really make a name that just works beautifully. All right, so all of the following guidelines are going to be in this else path for the kind of if statement that I made on the previous slide. In other words, these are guidelines for making names for procedures where those procedures are not specifically event procedures that handle exactly one controls event. If in any point in that description there is some kind of exception for the procedure that you are working on, uh, this is where you want to go for naming the procedure. For example, procedures that handle multiple events, which again, we'll get to soon. But that's what we're working with with these strong recommendations for uh, how you should name your procedures in order to make it very clear what those procedures are actually doing. So I really recommend that you do look at these and follow them. First off, you're going to want to use Pascal case, not camel case. Uh, camel case is what we've been recommending you use for your variables as well as for your controls. You start with a lowercase letter for the first word in your variable's name, and then the second word, which is smashed together against the first word, no space or no underscore, no period or anything like that. Um, second word is going to have an uppercase first letter of that word. 
and then third word will have an uppercase first letter of that word and so on and so forth. Uh, every word smashed together into this variable, variable name starts with an uppercase letter except for the first word. Pascal case, on the other hand, you smash together a whole bunch of words into a particular name, but all of the words start with uppercase letters. So the first letter of a Pascal case name is uppercase. And this is what you should use for your procedure names. If they're not uh, an event procedure for one controls event. Because in that case, you're using uh, camel case specifically because um, that's the name of the control, right? So in this case, you want to use Pascal case for your procedures and it helps uh, it helps you recognize that they are separate from the uh, variables that you're working with. So procedures with the uppercase first letter are going to look different than variables with the lowercase first letter. It's going to be really helpful for you. You're not going to get them confused at all. So I really do recommend that. Now the first word of your procedure name that will probably have multiple words in it, uh, that first word is normally going to be a verb. Not always, but normally. And the reason why is because this verb is going to describe what action the procedure is doing. And then it's followed by, you know, what is being verbed on, I, I guess you could say. So for example, clear output labels. Uh, this is a procedure that takes all of your output labels and whatever text is in them, it clears them out. It replaces them with the empty string. So every single output label, that dot text property gets set to the empty string so that there's nothing in there. And a clear output labels procedure is going to be really helpful for if you are handling any sort of event where the user is changing any input values that actually affect the output, um, you know, what's being put in the output, right? So if they start typing in a new value for something or choosing a new option or anything like that, you could send all of that to some clear output labels procedure that resets all of the output labels so that there's no old output just in case the user forgot to click the calculate button or whatever and then thinks okay well all of this output is for this changed input and they get the wrong answer so that can be really helpful helpful there uh we have calc square root we are calculating the square root. That's what the procedure does. Of what? Presumably the parameters. Uh, we'll talk more about this, the kind of procedure that this name might be really useful for in just a little bit because uh, calc square root, you know, you're probably not going to be using this name for an event procedure, right? This is probably more of a, um, well, you know, we'll get to it. And then we have another name, which I'm personally very partial to. Uh, and, you know, we might not talk about this type of procedure for a little bit as well. You know, the type of procedure that I would think to use this uh, name for. But imagine, if you will, a procedure that takes in some number and then figures out if that number is even and somehow is able to give us a boolean value representing whether or not that number is even. That's where you could use the name is even. Uh, is even asks a question. It's a verb. Is is a verb. It's uh, one of those um, e verbs. I forget the exact name of them. It's been a hot minute since I've taken high school English, but it is a verb, but it's asking, is it even? Is what even? Whatever you're giving it, but is even is a great procedure name because it is asking a yes or no question. It is asking 
almost asking a true or false kind of thing. It can be answered by true or false. Is this even true? False, right? So when you have is like this, like this as the first word of a procedure name, it can often suggest Boolean. It can suggest logic. So this type of name can be really cool to use and we'll see what type of function or sorry what type of procedure i'm giving it away right now what type of procedure is even will be really good for in a couple videos but i already said this you want to make the name descriptive you want the name to say exactly what the procedure is doing and you want to add a comment right underneath the procedure procedure header to really just nail in exactly what that procedure is doing. Descriptive name plus comment means anyone who's looking at your code is going to know exactly what's going on. Now, in the immediate sense, that'll be helpful for you because when I'm looking at your code, it'll be a lot easier for me to understand what's going on, which might help you get a better grade. Uh, if I don't know what's going on, I might have a harder time, you know, helping you. If your uh, code isn't working and I'm trying to say this is where it's not working, if you have a descriptive name and a whole bunch of comments, that's going to make it a lot easier for me to give you that feedback so then you can take that feedback and have it reflected in future assignments, right? Gives you a better grade. However, it's also helpful in the future if you work with other people and they're looking at your code trying to figure out what's going on and you have this descriptive name, you have this descriptive comment, they're going to know, oh, well, that's what this procedure does. That's really helpful. Now I can work either using this procedure or I can work alongside and, you know, know that this functionality is already taken care of in this procedure or something like that. Uh, we'll talk more about teamwork in not too long. Uh, in the next video. But teamwork is a massive part of being a programmer, so you should be practicing writing your procedures as if someone is looking at them and trying to figure out what they're doing and using them and not able to ask you what's going on. Alright, so what we have here is a monthly payment calculator. Uh, for some kind of loan where you have a principal amount and the interest rate at which you have to make a monthly payment um, and then you actually can calculate it and it shows you the monthly payments right here. For example, if I uh, try to pay off a $2,000 loan at 3%, uh, it's going to show me if I want to pay it over 15 years, I can do $13.81 a month. If I want to pay it over 20 years, I can do $11.09 a month. 25 years would be $9.48 a month, and 30 years would be $8.43. Taking into account, of course, uh, the monthly interest that I am accruing on this um, principal amount. Now, let's say I mistyped $2,000. Um, I was actually trying to type in $20,000 and, oh, hang on, uh, my, um, my partner is actually calling me because, uh, you know, my cat got her claws stuck in my partner's, uh, shirt and she's not able to get the cat out by herself, so I actually have to go and get her and I'm, I'm wrestling with the cat and really trying to get her claws out, but her claws are, like, really dug into this shirt for whatever reason and it's just oh it's a whole mess but after a grueling process i finally unstick my cat i um kiss my partner on the cheek i leave her be and i come back to my monthly payment calculator and i look at this and i say oh well i've typed in twenty thousand at three percent you know that's the principal principal amount that's the amount on my loan I, I see I've already calculated this, so I can pay off my $20,000 loan in 15 years simply by paying $13.81. Now, dear viewer, notice that I never pressed calculate after I updated 20000 
I typed in 20,000. I was about to press calculate, but I got so distracted by my cat being an absolute menace that I forgot to hit calculate. And now I think I can pay off my loan with 1381 a month in 15 years. That's incredible. Only it's too good to be true because, in fact, that would only be paying off 2000 at 3%, not 20000 at 3%. And I would be in a lot of trouble if I did that. Now, I'm sure we won't really be coding anything for something this dire. Although, you know, I can't actually say that because... We never want to assume that we can just relax and not worry about this kind of stuff, right? So, what we should do is clear out this label whenever the principal amount changes, and that would completely solve the problem. Because when I typed in 20,000, that should have changed. I apologize, not changed, but that should have cleared out the monthly payment. Not automatically recalculated it, mind you. Because if it's recalcula recalculating and recalculating and recalculating as I type, uh, it's going to be harder for me to notice my own mistakes. And why do all that calculation when we don't really need to? Because only one of those results out of the, in this case, five if I was typing 20,000, only one of them is going to be correct anyway. So why not just clear out the um, monthly payment box here once the user starts changing whatever value is in this principal text box, right? So let's do that. I'll exit the application. And right here, you know, it's already started for us. Uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. We have this one, pay no attention to that one. We have this procedure, text principal underscore text change. Well, that must handle the uh, text principal uh, text change event. So that's actually what I want. That's perfect. We want this text box. Whenever this text box is changed, uh, we want the label to be um, replaced by the empty string right here. So in this case, it would be string dot empty. We'll set our output labels. Um, we'll set our output labels uh, dot text property to be equal to the empty string whenever the user types in a uh, types in a new value into that text box. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so I've started the application up from scratch. Uh, I'll start with. I'll do the exact same thing. $2,000 principal at 3%. I'll calculate it. And we have the monthly payment that we saw before. And now I'm going to reenact what happens. So I um, type in a zero to make it 20,000. Oh, monthly payment is already gone. Oh, my cat's stuck in my partner's uh, shirt again. So I better go save her. Um, well, I come back and I see that there are no results in monthly payments, so I know I need to recalculate it. Oh, $138.12, huh? That's a steep monthly payment, but I guess that's doable. Uh, so that is the kind of magic that you can do with, um, with this text change event, right? So that's why that's a good idea, but well, I just realized too, I got the rate percent wrong. That should be down at 5% because oh, this uh, this loan was really, really a rough one, but I really needed to take it. So that's a 5% loan right there. And um, oh, oh no, my cat's stuck again. This time, this time my cat's stuck like, oh, my, you know, my stairs, they have like carpet on the side of them. My, my cat's like somehow stuck on that. She's just standing sideways on it, yowling. So I better, I better go fix her. And she's fighting back. She doesn't know that I'm trying to help her. But I, she doesn't like it when I grab her paws, even if I'm just trying to like get her unstuck. So uh, I better unstick her. And I come back and, oh, well, I guess a monthly payment for 5% isn't so bad. I, th I think I can 
maybe do one hundred thirty eight dollars every month and and the twelve cents too, so that's good, but that wouldn't do it because this was the calculated value for three percent, so we have to do that for this list as well. We need to figure out how to get the user uh you know when 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 they change their value here, that needs to also reset the monthly payment. So we have to make some changes. Well, the way that we make those changes is we use an event procedure for uh, the selected index changed um, event of a list like this. So we can actually do the same thing right here when we uh, see that the user has changed the index of which item was selected on the list. When they select a new item on the list, they uh, trigger this selected index changed event, which then means we can catch that with one of these um, event procedures right here and set label pay.txt to be the empty string. So now, when we run that, 20,000 at 3%, we calculate that, and now I come down here to 5%. Oh, I, and then I go and free my cat from the stairs. Uh, I don't know how she keeps on getting stuck there, but it's a problem. And I come back and, um, you know, empty monthly payment thing here. So I know, oh, well, I need to uh, click this and, oh, that, okay, that is too much. I can't pay that every month. So I better find a new loan. Uh, maybe find a different bank or something like that. But... That is the benefit of doing that. Now, here's my problem with this type of solution, right? Is that we have two event procedures that do exactly the same thing. But the only differences between these two are the events that they handle and the name of the procedure. And the name of the procedure isn't even that important. I mean, it's good to name a procedure the way that this is named um but the name itself really could be anything right so the name isn't so important it's just the fact that each handles a different uh you know a a, a different event that's the big thing that is making these be you know different procedures and that's really annoying because we have all these procedures that are doing the same thing. And suppose we had the user putting in like 20 different pieces of information and we had 20 of these procedures that whenever the user was changing how they interacted with each of those uh, input controls, right? Uh, we had to code a separate procedure for each one. We'd be clogging up this file with so much code that was just so repetitive and making it hard to find anything else in this code you know any any meaningful function or any meaningful procedures or you know find the source of any mistake and you know hopefully you got all of that rep repetitive code right the first time because if you change one of those procedures you have to end up changing all of those procedures if you did it wrong at first, right? And then, oh gosh, if you forget to update one of those procedures, you know, maybe 19 of them are, but number eight isn't. And that one's working incorrectly. That's also really bad. So it's such a shame that you have to do all that repetition because repetition of code can cause so many problems. It can make it hard to navigate the file. It can lead to a lot of errors. It can just cause all sorts of issues. And what am I doing automatically like that? I, I My hands just moved on their own. What is this? We have this procedure that handles text principle dot text change and List rates dot selected index changed. It handles both of them. Well, I can tell that it handles both of them because of this comma 
between the two events that it's handling. You can do that, huh? You can have one event procedure handle multiple events. Well, I mean, we can try it. Let's see, if I select all this, yeah. And if I, uh, I run it, and I hope that my, my hands didn't make me uh, code something wrong there. Well, let's try just 2003%. This one should work. Yeah, 20,000. That clears it out. I'll calculate that. I'll just go down to a 2% rate and- Oh, that works too! Well, what do you know? As it turns out, you can have one event procedure handling multiple events like this, and that procedure will run every single time any of these events gets happened. This procedure was run when I changed the text in the text box, and the procedure was run when I changed the index of the item that I selected on the list. I selected a new item on the list, right? That's really cool. So whenever it sees either of these happen, whenever the user changes their input on either of these controls, it just empties out the output string. Well, this is something that you should do. Not just, you know, have your uh, application empty out its outputs whenever the user changes their input, you know, selects different values on lists or uh, checkboxes or anything like that, or not just uh, typing in new values in a text box or anything like that, but also, you know, having them all handled in one single uh, event procedure like this. Now you might have noticed that this name isn't so great anymore because it doesn't just handle uh, the text changed event of text principal, but it also handles this other one too. And if I tried to make it text principal underscore text change underscore list rates underscore selected index change. That's, that's just awful. So why don't we go back to the, um, the guidelines for the procedures. And remember that because this handles more than one event, if you follow those, gu those guidelines, it no longer qualifies for one of these types of names where you have the name of the control and then the name of the event separated by an underscore. No, now we're doing a proper procedure name. Pascal case starts with a verb, um, has other stuff after it too. We're going to make a proper procedure name right here because this is a proper event handling procedure with multiple events. It deserves one. So let's think about what this procedure is doing. This is, um, and you know, you would actually do this before you're actually writing code. This would, this would be in the, um, the actual pseudocode stage or the flowchart stage, right? Is where you're deciding what this name is. But, you know, we're modifying existing code, so we might as well. Uh, what is this procedure doing though? It is. Well, when, when, when we get new output, this procedure gets run. So we don't need to worry about user changing input or anything like that. The user changing their input is handled somewhere else. We're just getting the signal that, hey, it's time to clear out the output because of this handle thing. You know, we handle the things where uh, that get generated when the user changes the input, like wh when they change the input, Visual Basic gives us that signal. So Visual Basic already has handled the input side of things. We're just handling the output. We're clearing out the output after the user has given us their input. Hang on. What did I just say there? Clearing out the output? Clear output. Clear output. Okay, well, it clears the verb. 
we're clearing the output. Maybe make that a little more descriptive. Clear output label. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. Because this is the procedure that not just that that um clears out the output label, but this is the one that gets run, or at least should get run, in every possible case where the output label needs to be cleared. So if I added a third piece of input with a new control, maybe like some radio buttons that the user had to select, uh, saying, I, I don't know, whether, whether, whether or not they liked dogs, right? But somehow if that was important to the calculation of the monthly payment, well, whenever those radio buttons were changed, the, the user selected a different button there, that would also have to be handled by this function. You know, the user selects a new radio button on this imaginary third output. That output needs to be cleared, so might as well make it handled by the procedure that clears the output label. So that's why this name works so well. It says what it's doing, but it also says this is what you should invoke every time the output label needs to be cleared. Meaning, any event that gets generated when the user does something that should clear the label, stick that output on here. Or sorry, stick that event here. Put that on the handles list. So, that's what we're going to call it. Clear output label. And when clear output label gets called, or gets invoked by Visual Basic, well, I should say, um, not that one is more correct than the other, but, well, that's a whole thing. Anyway, clear output label gets invoked when the text change event of text principal and the selected index changed event of list rates. Uh, when any of those get tossed out by Visual Basic, it's going to catch it and invoke clear output label and make everything in here happen. And we can test it. And I hope I coded that right. Okay. 1,003%. Uh, if I ch uh, try a different value on the list, that clears it. If I change the text box amount, that clears it. Awesome and epic. Cool. So that is how you can make a event procedure that handles multiple events and how to name it really nicely. And of course, I, I did mention this. Um, you should put a comment as well. Uh, clears the uh, output label. When the user um, changes their input or something like that, right? So that is how you would make a good comment that pairs well with a good name for a procedure. Now one note about this is that when you have multiple um, events handled by one procedure, you need to make sure that the functions that actually handle those events are, um, you know, they, they actually take in the same parameters. Because there are some events that take in different parameters um, you, that don't have sender of type object and e of type event args, which would be a problem if you stuck one of those events at the end of this list of things that clear output label actually handles. Uh, the reason why is because um, if Visual Basic even allowed that, let's say our mystery third event had three parameters instead of two. If Visual Basic even allowed that, and it was trying to cram three parameters into a two-parameter um, a, a two-parameter procedure, at best there would be an error. At worst, uh, weird stuff starts happening in memory, and that's how you get uh, really bad exploits, uh, which is a, which are a huge security risk. So. We don't um, let that happen. 
Similarly, if our mystery third event had only one parameter and we uh, tried to stick one argument into this two parameter uh, procedure right here, there wouldn't be enough information. None of this would be filled out for E. So we, uh, we don't want either of those cases to happen. They should have the exact same number of parameters. They should have the, the exact same types for the parameters too. First one object, second one event args in this case. Now, if you want to be sure that they have the uh, same parameters and you should do this every time you're trying to make a uh, procedure that handles multiple um, controls events like this, uh, you should for each one of these uh, events of a control, what I would do at least is First off, let's uh, start with text principal. And ta -da! was text change like so. That went somewhere. Let me try that again. It might not be happy with it because uh, I've already Okay, yeah, it's not happy because I already have a text change right here. Let's take two random uh, events right here. That's my apologies. Text principal. Um, okay, enter has already been done. Key press has already been done. Uh, let's say leave when the user is no longer actually typing inside of the text box. Let's say you're doing something for text principal dot leave. Uh, and also, let's say, and probably you would know this ahead of time, let's look at the dot leave for list rates as well, right? So you're trying to make a procedure that handles when you leave, when the user leaves any of the input controls. Now what I've done is I have created these blank event procedures for each of these events. And I can check and see, okay, do these have the same parameters, which they do. Same names, same, well, the names of the parameters are important, but the types are the same. Uh, the number of parameters is the same. We're good to go. Now all I have to do is just copy this over here, put a comma after the first event, paste the second event, update the name. Bye-bye. Uh, That's a bad procedure name because it's not really telling you what the procedure is doing, but I don't know what the procedure is doing. I just uh, pulled this out of thin air, like a magician for this example. So that's a good way of checking to make sure that your multiple event procedure will work fine before getting an error. All right, well, this line is pretty long. That's, and that's not so much an issue of, you know, the code not working. But it's going to be pretty hard to see in certain cases. For example, when I start, it gets cut off by the diagnostic tools. Another example is if I zoom in, maybe I have a hard time seeing. I have to scroll all the way over. And it is a problem for me recording the videos like this because I, uh, well, I can't show you the whole line unless I zoom out, but then it's harder for people to see on the video. So that is an issue. Well, maybe if we just press enter right here and well, no, that doesn't actually work because it's not valid to have a line of code that starts with the word handles. So there's got to be a better way, right? There is. Now, the nice thing is, is that there are ways of, in the code editor, breaking up a very li long line of code into two or more in such a way that they're treated as the same line of code. They're not treated like what happened 
uh, just before when uh, essentially Visual Basic thought that I was trying to start a new statement with the word handles, which is um, not correct. But there are ways of telling Visual Basic, hey, I'm not starting it with the, the word handles. This is continuing on from the next line of code. Or sorry, from the previous line of code. So they ac actually treat these both as one. There's a lot of different methods that we can do that with. Now, you can just press the enter key and have the two lines of code treated as the same line under very specific circumstances. That line break, you pressing enter or return or whatever it is on your computer, it must come directly before a closing parenthesis. It must also come directly after an opening parenthesis, not just anywhere in between two parentheses, mind you. It has to either come directly after the opening parentheses or directly before the closing parentheses. Um, it could come directly after a comma, or it could come directly after an operator, like plus or minus or and or greater than or equal to or anything like that. As long as these rules are satisfied, the line break can well be placed there. Now, right here, line 53, this very long if statement goes all the way out there. Um, this actually has some really great examples of uh, places where we could possibly put a um, line break. So, for example, um, we have this and uh, statement right here. This well, and also, but I'll I'll just call it an and, um, where we have something and something. Now, what I could do, if this line was a little too long for me, is I could hit enter directly after and also. And it gets counted as being part of this if statement. Now I'll give the um, statement block a little bit of breathing room. But we have this lined up. Well, it's lined up pretty well. But because this E isn't actually inside of this parenthesis group right here, uh, I'm actually going to back it up by one space. Um, well, it, kind of, oh, it does kind of look ugly. But, you know... The nice thing about doing it like this is that since this if statement itself is essentially something and something, uh, I can put the right hand operand onto the next line. And that's kind of a bit of a clean break right there. But because I pressed enter right after this operator right here, it works. In fact, I could press enter after this operator too. And after this operator. And this one. And at this point, I'm just going crazy with it. But... It works just fine. So that's something that we can actually do is press enter after operators in order to make, you know, a line continuation in order to continue our line of code on the next line of the program. All right, so the next um, thing I want to show off is the parentheses. So, uh, if I can do it right before an end parenthesis, right before a closing parenthesis there, and that will work just fine. I can do it also before an opening parenthesis. Now, you, I wouldn't want to do it like this, but if the um, opening parenthesis was like way out here, in fact, actually, if we did this, let's say, surrounded this uh, right-hand side in parentheses and then I put an enter right there, that would be a good time to do the line, uh, line break before the, or sorry, right after the opening parenthesis. But directly before or directly after, sorry, directly before the closing parenthesis, the right parenthesis, or directly after the left parenthesis, the opening parenthesis, 
both work. However, you can't just put it anywhere between the parentheses, because if I did it there, um, that is going to cause an error, as you can see, syntax error. Uh, it doesn't say what. Actually, we get two errors right here, a parent closing parenthesis expected and a syntax error on the second line, because this is not a valid line break. So it treats these as two different lines of code. Thinks that this one, this first one, which it thinks is a complete line of code, is it thinks it's missing a an opening parenthesis. Oh, sorry, a closing parenthesis because we just have the opening one here. And because it thinks this is its own line of code, the first syntax error it sees is that you start with an or else, but there's no operand on the left side. So that's a problem. You can't put it anywhere between two parentheses. You have to either put it directly after the left parenthesis or directly before the right parenthesis. Or any place within the parenthesis that is valid to do so, like after or else here. It's just that you can't do it anywhere. Now, the last place we mentioned was after a comma. So, for example, the comma between the parameters right here. Actually, I'll do it in here because we're trying to uh, work on this one right now. But the comma between parameters would work in this case. Um, yeah, there's no issues found right here. Everything is all good. But that's kind of awkward. I mean, we could do it, and we could also do this, but we're not really saving ourselves much space by doing this. Maybe if it was really desperate and like all these parameters were really long for whatever reason, um, we could try that, but that's kind of awkward. Well, we could try the, the comma between the different events right here. But now that's all also awkward because the um, the events that are being handled are separated from each other, and you know this is still going off the screen. Uh, there's a comma there, and then this one right here is down here. That that's also kind of awkward, but it's possible. It's just not going to work for this particular problem, where we have this long thing. Right? We're we're not. Uh, going to have an easy way of breaking this line. Maybe just putting all of the events that are handled on the next line. There's no way of really doing that super easily. Not with those rules, at least. But there's a trick up our sleeve that we can use. Now that trick up our sleeve is called the line continuation character, which is a character that we can type in order to break up lines anywhere. We can split a line anywhere, almost anywhere really, but we can split a line in most places using this character that signals to Visual Basic, hey, I am explicitly telling you that this line continues on the next line. So this statement that I'm writing will continue on the next line, but it's still part of the same statement. Don't forget that. So. The way you can actually enter the line continuation character is you type a space after the last non-space character of the first line that you want to create. You know, you have your statement, you're trying to break it up into two lines, you type a space after the last non-space character of the first line you want to create, and then type an underscore, press enter or return or whatever, that takes you to the next line, and then you continue typing. It is that easy. So if we want to have the function header for clear output label separated across two lines, and let's say we want the handles and then all of the events that are being handled on the next line so that they're all together, it's really easy having that grouped together because you have all that information in one spot, you don't have to hunt for it, right? You know, you have the function name and the parameters on the first line and all the events that it's handling and the handles flaws on the second. Now what you would do is after this closing parentheses that surrounds the parameters, you put a space, space like this, an underscore, press enter, and it's that easy. Uh, it's not even going to give us any syntax errors, you can give it a little more time to think about it, but it, it's not. 
And doesn't that look nice? We're all nice and zoomed in. Everything on the first line is the name of the procedure and the parameters, which is how, you know, this gives us how the procedure is invoked, and this gives us everything that needs to be given to the procedure that will be more important in the following videos, but that's important to have together. And then on the next line, we have the handles clause, which shows all the events that are being handled. Isn't that lovely? So that's a good way of breaking up this procedure um, header like this. Also, I guess uh, a, a good reason to have the name and parameters on the same line is because when you're working on it, you can recognize like, okay, this is the name of what I'm working on and these are the parameters. Uh, that information will tell you like, this is the um, purpose that needs to be worked on for this procedure. It will actually help a lot with um, remembering what the parameters are, what they're supposed to be doing, why you need to use them, all that kind of stuff. Um, here's another example of using the uh, line continuation character right here. If I wanted to, for some ungodly reason, use it before the and also operator instead of right after, that, w which does look kind of ugly, but you, you can if you want. Uh, I'll go to the right of this parenthesis right here, type a space, type the line continuation character, press enter, and it will be good. Um, the reason why you would want to do the line break after the operator, though, is because uh, it's, I don't know, the, just something about the, inform the information flow. It uh, reads a lot easier if you have like, okay, well, here's a calculation first. Oh, and then here's an operator that I'm doing it with. So I need to keep that in mind when I move down here to look at the second operand versus, okay, well, here's like a random thing. Let me move, let me move on to the next line. Okay, so now there's an operator here, but there's no left-hand side. Oh, was the operator supposed to have a left-hand side of what was on the previous line? And that can get a little bit confusing. It takes a little bit longer, all that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't recommend doing it like that. But if you want to, line continuation character. Uh, you can also put it in just any awful, awful place, like between sender and as. And it gives you this weird indent and all that kind of stuff, but it works, doesn't it? It sure works. Uh, use it with care, is my recommendation. Here's a, a couple more cursed examples. Um, this actually uh, is a regular line break example, because remember that the dot is an actual operator, the dot access operator. Um, we are accessing some property of the string class, uh, the, the property in this case having the name empty, so that we are accessing the empty property of string, string.empty, right? We go to string, and then we go to its empty property. Uh, because it's an operator, you can just press enter, and that works. I don't like it, personally, but it, it's useful if you have a lot of um, stuff at the end and you need to like really just break it at some point in some chain of dot operators and stuff like that so if i did dot empty dot trim dot two upper none of which would actually really do anything but if i did all of this kind of stuff right and i made the line very long i could um do something like string dot empty and then try to indent this out here to uh, dot empty dot trim dot two upper and stuff like that. It looks odd, doesn't it? But it totally works. And then of course the limitations of the um, line continuation character. If I try to bisect string right here by pressing space in the line continuation character and then putting it to the next line, wait for it. Uh, visual basic doesn't recognize str and it doesn't recognize ing it doesn't recognize that these are well it thinks that they're the same line is the funny thing 
it thinks that this is this statement is on the same line because of that line continuation character, but it sees this. It doesn't see string as one word, it's a it sees S T R space I N G. So you can't do it in the middle of words. All right, well, that is event procedures with a little bit of a detour into line breaks and line continuation and all that kind of stuff. But all of that work with event procedures hopefully will help provide a stable base for the rest of the procedures talk that we are talking about because we are going to break free from events and just talk about non-event procedures from here on out. So, hope you enjoy what comes.